pornography, Nazis, UFOs, vaccines, and capital riots. Um, just in, in case you weren't traumatized enough by the last time I talked to you, well, uh, you know, further down the rabbit hole we go. So I got lots of stuff to do. You don't have to be tested on this. So I'm going to go pretty fast because there's no way I'm getting through all this stuff and getting you to the end and through all the convolutions without doing so. So off we go. Atlantis. Let's get this sucker working. I have to move it so I can see a few more people. Otherwise, it drives me a little bit crazy. Uh, and there. Come on over here. Well, let me do this too real quick. All right. Okay, so you are seeing a screen with some pictures of Atlantis in various forms. Yes? Give me a thumbs up. Okay, good. And I always make to make sure the technology is working. Atlantis, the gift that keeps on giving. Plato started talking about Atlantis a long, long time ago. Um, it appears obviously in popular culture. Still, uh, one of my students said that this was a really fabulous movie. Somehow I skipped that, missed that, uh, and I shouldn't denigrate that movie, so I won't. But, you know, Atlantis, turns out, is a problem. Okay, so here's Plato. You know, Atlantis was this highly sophisticated, supposed to be this highly sophisticated culture, superior technology, invented kind of all the science that was known to, to men at the time. Um, an earthquake pulled the island under the sea and everybody even back then was kind of okay with the idea that this was an allegory that was talking about the dangers of hubris and technology and, and stuff like this. But that didn't stop anybody from continuing to think about Atlantis. And as you go forward in time, the myth of Atlantis, the idea of Atlantis is still there. It's Atlantis as the first civilization, as the, the, the ultimate, the ideal that from which we have fallen. Okay, so stay with me. Things are gonna get a little crazy. First stop is going to be, um, you know, where is Atlantis? Well, here's what we, we see. This is later. We'll get to who did this later, but Atlantis is here. Atlantis is maybe in the Mediterranean. Uh, no, no, no. Atlantis moves. Atlantis is a continent. Once it got sunk, it didn't stay there. It went to di different places, or at least people had different ideas. And the first stop is going to be a guy by the name of Jean-Sylvain Bailly, a French astronomer in the late 1700s. He was also ended up being the mayor of France and ultimately got his head chopped off by the guillotine because he was on the wrong side of the French Revolution. But that's neither here for, nor there for the moment. Bailly was an astronomer. And I'm not gonna talk about the astronomy part too much because we don't have time. And a bird just flew into the window. Excuse me for being distracted. I'm not sure what happened. He sought to identify the proto Ur civilization and Ur civilization we're using in the German sense here of the earliest first original um, civilization. And you gotta remember that in the late 1700s, a bunch of things are, are, are kind of happening in addition, in addition to the French Revolution. People are translating old Egyptian, um, Indian, Chinese documents. They're kind of finding out, hey, there's other traditions out there besides that biblical tradition. And, you know, uh, some of these things seem to be older than the Bible. And maybe, you know, something else is going on. Sanskrit is being translated for the, for the first time. And this is, this is all kind of throwing everybody for, for a loop. Um, Bailly also was interested in myths. And there was another guy who I won't talk about who wrote this big set of volumes on, on myths of the world. And he was interested um, in the idea, and this may sound familiar for any of you who have been here on earlier weeks, that myths were based in fact. And anything that was talked about in the myth was actually in fact something that really happened a long time ago and it's all gotten lost and hidden and miss and the meanings are, are but they're still kind of there and so Bailly started looking into the myths and he said ah well you know the basic myth underlying all this stuff is the sun and the moon right he went to simplicity here and when you look at other myths you th see things like Hercules and Hercules represents the sun. And he goes underground in his 12th labor to capture Cerberus. 
Oh, interesting. And Persephone also disappears underground. Hmm. Both of them, the sun, images of the sun disappearing underground must mean something about the sun leaving the earth for part of the, the year. Oh, where does that happen? It happens up north. Uh huh. So he comes up with an idea of a Hyperborean Atlantis, a high north Atlantis. And you see over here, this is sort of a an early map representing sort of a Hyperborean idea over here. Earth was warmer in the past, by the way, and this has to do with, with the influence of climate and, and Georges de Buffon and Montesquieu and other people like that. Again, no, no time to, to do things like that. Um, Atlantis sinks. Atlantis is in the north. Is everything's cooled down. Atlantis sinks. Atlantis is lost. But the knowledge passes to the south and it first passes to the east in the Orient because this is a period of, of, of Orientalism and, and fascination with the Orient as well. And then it moves to the West. And also at the same time, if we look at philology, we look at languages, origins of languages, we've got Sanskrit over there to the East, we've got Greek and Latin to the West, and they seem to share some sort of root. And where would that be? It would be in the middle. And what is in the middle? The Caucasus are in the middle. And who is from the Caucasus? The Aryans because Aryan comes from Sanskrit and it means noble. And so the original civilization, even though it's Atlantis in the North, it comes to the South and it enters, civilization enters from the North into the Caucasus. Hmm, maybe you see where this might be going. Okay, everybody with me? Because this makes total sense. The logic is perfect. I, it just, it's, it's, it's brilliant. Just keep rolling with it. Okay, next. We move to the late 1800s and Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, who founds Theosophy, something that maybe you've heard of. If you're like me from a few years ago, you're like, what the, what is this? It is huge. Um, it's mystically, a mystically based worldview, um, occult knowledge, secret knowledge, Esotericism and mysticism is huge at this time. In the late 1800s, everybody's doing spiritualism, seances, and, and all this craziness. And Blavatsky is informed by Tibetan ascended masters who speak to her, somehow revealed knowledge. And what she comes up with is this whole idea here, which is this idea that, <coughs> excuse me, that life passed through these stages, these spiritual stages, these root races. And the first root race is the polar race, and I'm not going to go through them all. The Hyperborean race, which you will recognize. The Lemurian race, that's the first one to have physical bodies and actually um, interbred with, with apes. To, never mind. Um, and then we get the Atlantean race, right? which is the fourth root race. And the Atlantean race, as they die, they pass the knowledge of science, of everything good, on to the Aryan race, which is the fifth root race, which is where they were in the late 1800s. The Atlanteans and the Aryans civilized Egypt, Greece, Rome, and the ancestors to the current Europeans. Okay, all of these root races, have sub races underneath them. And to make it simple, we're just gonna stick with the, the fifth root race, the Aryan race. And one of the sub root races of the Aryan race was the Semitic sub race. Anti-Semitism is very big at this point in time, actually it's been big for, for kind of a long time. Um, and the Aryans and the Semitic races are kind of opposite poles. Um, the, the Aryans represent sincerity and all that is good, and the, the Semitic races is, is concealment and all that is bad. And the, in this case, the Semitic race, the Jewish race, literally, stood in the way of progress of the natural ordained march of the races. There's, in the future, there's the idea of a sixth root race to come, a race of Uber mention. Again, maybe this is foreshadowing a bit. 
but this is all out of Blavatsky, who publishes the secret doctrine in, in 1888. Uh, um, ISIS revealed, ISIS unveiled is 18 to some. These things are like 1,300, 1,500 pages long. Um, and Blavatsky in the secret doctrine cites Bailly, that's the French astronomer that we started with 22 times. And she places Atlantis in the north, Hyperborean Atlantis. Okay, slight detour, 1882, Ignatius Donnelly, minute, former Senator from Minnesota who got like kicked out and various other things. And for some reason he had this giant occult library because I remember occultism was huge in the late 1800s. And in 1882, he publishes Atlantis, the Antediluvian world because everything that we've seen from Blavatsky sets up all these races, but it doesn't really make them white. I just be straight up with you. But Donnelly does because Donnelly is following on the myth of the mound builders, which is in North America, this myth that had been around for a long time. Andrew Jackson used it to justify the Indian Removal Act in 1830, that all these mounds that we found in North America were actually built by a lost white race that was here first. And if this has echoes of Salutrianism, yeah, it certainly does. This is kind of the myth that starts all this stuff in the first place. All right, lost white race before the natives. Now we've got that with Atlantis, which causes, and, and um, Donnelly causes this huge Atlantis thing in the late 18, this Atlantis craze in the late 1800s, coupled with Blavatsky. This is all stuff that is, that is kind of out there. So guess who's interested in this stuff? The precursors to the Nazi party. Pick up on all this stuff. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, but this, by the way, of course, is the this is the Theosophy Society, which still exists in uh, in Wheaton, Illinois, is the headquarters of the Theosophy Society, and this is the kind of the the early symbol of the Theosophy Society. And of course, if you know anything about the the swastika or the sun wheel here, it's a huge thing in the East. It's this. It's this pan Asian thing that the, the Nazis kind of pick up on. All right, jump forward. Nazis, early 1900s, uh, right before World War I. Uh, they found what is called the Germanen Orden, the Germanic or Teutonic Order. And this is a paramilitary kind of, kind of um, secret society. And again, Oh, I haven't even tied this into Freemasonry yet and other things like that, but secret societies, big hidden knowledge, occult. Remember, that's all, all part of this. Well, in Bavaria, Baron Rudolf von Sabotendorf starts the Bavarian chapter and he calls this the Thule Society, T-H-U-L-E. Thule is another name or another word that is applied to this Hyperborean Nordic civilization this Atlantean idea of the original civilization occurring in the north and coming south. And so early on, before we get Nazis or anything yet, we get this establishment of this, this Thule society with a myth of a Hyperborean Atlantis as the precursor to all civilization and becomes part of the mythic history and ideology of the Nazis. Um, all right, one second. Wrong one, wrong one, wrong one, 279. This is from um, Alfred Rosenberg, who if you know Nazi history well, you'll know is fairly influential, uh, from his myth of the 20th century. All in all, the old legends of Atlantis may appear in new light. It seems far from impossible that in areas over which the Atlantic waves roll and a giant icebergs float, a flourishing, a flourishing continent once rose above the waters, and upon it, a creative race produced a far-reaching culture and sent its children out into the world as seafarers and warriors. But even if this Atlantis hypothesis should prove untenable, a prehistoric Nordic cultural center must be assumed. Okay. We're going to stop with Nazis. Let's just suffice it to say that that idea 
Plato to Bailly to Blavatsky through Donnelly to Nazis to Ubermenschen, you can probably fill in where it happens, what happens from there. Because we got to turn to UFOs. And yes, there is continuity. Okay. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Ooh. Oh, oh, and I, I should just really briefly, because I got a slide here. Um, this is the House Atlantis, um, built, uh, finished in 1931 in Bremen in northern Germany. And originally on the side of it, this had a, a giant crucified Odin on the tree of life because Nordic and all that kind of stuff. And that'll come back. All right, back to theosophy again. So Blavatsky, we got all that. Everybody's good with Blavatsky. Oh, wait a minute. I forgot to talk about the Lemurian race a little bit more. So here's the Lemurian race back here. Remember they bred with the apes to produce some kind of mongrel sort of race kind of thing here. Um, and what we see as we get into ufology, UFOs, is these older scientific and theological paradigms mix and combine with images from popular culture to form new sorts of things. Okay, so where do we go with here? So we go to pop fiction, uh, pulp fiction, pulp fiction of the 1940s, amazing stories, fate, things like this, and a guy by the name of Richard Shaver. Richard Shaver, by all accounts is a little bit um, unhinged. And he sends something into Roy, to Ray Palmer, who is the, the publisher of Amazing Stories and Fate and all these other things. And he calls it the Mantong Alphabet. And he says it comes back from this, this stuff he's been talked to by Taros and Daros who live in the hollow earth and are remnants of Titans and things like this. Shaver rewrites this as, I remember Lemuria meaning this is totally theosophical coming forward and this stuff is really popular. All right, next. God, this is fast. <laughs> next, sorry, um, 1947. So this is out there, people are loving this stuff. They're eating this stuff up. It's all feeding them theosophy and, and weirdness and it's pop culture working its way back around uh, with all the, the other old stuff that were before. 1947, Kenneth Arnold, a former Air Force pilot, is flying near Mount Rainier in Washington. And he sees an, uh, uh, something flying across the sky. And he describes it as a, like a, it was moving like a saucer would skipping across the water. He actually says it's crescent shaped and a few other things. And it turns out that the local newspapers pick that up and say, hey, he saw flying saucers. And here's um, Amazing Stories, another one of these Pulp Fictions from a little bit later. Um, and note here, is the government hiding saucer facts? Raymond Palmer says yes. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Okay, so we got flying saucers showing up in 1947. We also got Roswell in 1947. I'm skipping over that, might come back to it. Now, as we approach 1950, we start not only getting flying saucers being talked about, but we get contactees. And one of the first of these is a guy by the name of George Adamski. And George Adamski is a theosophist. His early publications are questions and answers from the Oil, Royal Order of Tibet, the Tibetan Ascendant Masters that talked to Blavatsky way back when. Okay, but that's okay. Um, in 1952, okay, we're going to Go back and forth a little bit here. 1952, November 1st, 1952 is when the news first comes out about the testing of the first H-bomb out in the Pacific. On November 20th of 1952, George Adamski takes a couple people out into the, the in, in California, into the Mojave Desert, and sees a cigar-shaped um, UFO or Thing flying in the sky and then suddenly he he wanders off by himself and he meets up with an alien named orthon and orthon talks to him telepathically and orthon oops wait a minute i'll go out of order um orthon looks like this this is orthon over here this is a painting done by uh Adamski's wife later with with orthon and orthon um is what we would call nordic alien or Nordique, 
uh, which if we get into the various sorts of aliens, which we, which we were gonna kind of briefly touch upon, this is a, a classic sort of alien. Um, and this is him uh, describing Orthon, about five feet six, round face with an extremely high forehead, large but calm gray green eyes, slightly aslant at the outer corners with slightly higher cheekbones than an occidental, but not so high as an Indian or an oriental, a finely chis chiseled nose, not conspicuously large, et cetera, et cetera. You note maybe the language that is being used here and you're gonna see that pop back up very, very shortly. So some of the first ones here, they're called Space Brothers. They're actually here to warn us about things. And, and um, Orthon ends up saying, hey, you know, you better watch out with all these weapons and this technology that you're using or something bad is going to happen. I will back up slightly to mention these two things. These are films that come out in 1951, The Day the Earth Stood Still, and The Thing from Another World. And in the day the earth stood still, the message from Klaatu, the alien who gets killed by the Air Force and resurrects himself, um, is we're worried about the nuclear weapons that you have. You better be peaceful or we're going to destroy you. And then he leaves. Just remember these two things. We'll come back to them. Okay. Next, we get George Hunt Williamson, who went with Adamski to meet Orthon, when he met Orthon, but he didn't meet Orthon himself because Adamski went across the way and then, Orth then he saw Orthon, but Orthon didn't talk to anybody else, you know, conveniently. Um, Adamski was also into sort of theosophy and, and he became um, part of this group called Soulcraft, which was an esoteric society founded by William Dudley Pelly in 1950. William Dudley Pelly was actually a Nazi supporter back in the 1930s. And he started something called the Silver Shirts, which was modeled on the Hitler Youth and the Brown Shirts. And then he was jailed for sedition in 1942 after running for president on the American Christian Party. But he gets out in 1950 and he found Soulcraft. And George Adamski says, hey, sign me up. I'm all over this thing. Adamski, I mean, excuse me, Adamski, Williamson, George Hunt Williamson is who we're talking about now, too many Georges. George Hunt Williamson uh, ends up uh, writing this book, The Saucers Speak, in which he talks about Blavatsky-like hierarchies, ancient breeding between aliens from Sirius, the, the star, and apes, Human, ape, uh, human apes, apes on earth that, that produce other sorts of things. But again, the messages of evils of pollution and war sort of unchecked. Um, and these are what we refer to as the Nordique aliens or the Aryan aliens and, and the blonde hair and, and um, light skin and features that we see here with, with Orthon are very close to this. And all the aliens at this time are coming from Venus or Mars or maybe another star that somebody recognizes. They're all in the neighborhood and they just stop by. And if you're not seeing the connections to ancient aliens, you should be because they're all breeding with us. And so Eric Von Donneken's got pr plenty of stuff to work with here. <sighs> okay, stay with me. Now we move to the next part. The next bit in the UFO sort of story here, which is the first alien abduction that occurs that gets widely publicized. And that is Betty and Barney Hill, um, who are on a journey. They, they go to uh, Quebec on sort of a, a vacation in 1961 and they're driving back home, they're driving through New Hampshire, and they have this period of lost time that they, they, they can't remember. Um, and they, they lose about two hours and they wake up later and there's these weird spots on the car and Barney has these weird warts on him and there's all kinds of weird stuff and they don't know what's happened. And they're an interracial couple in 1961. 
they get regressed eventually. So Betty contacts um, the local Air Force and, and tries to talk to people, talks to a guy named Donald Kehoe, who is actually trying to investigate scientifically whether there are UFOs or not. Eventually, they get regressed, um, hypnotic regression by a psychiatrist by the name of Benjamin Simon. And this is written up by um, a journalist by the name of John Fuller in a book called The Interrupted Journey, published in 1966. And quoting from one of my sources here, I won't tell you who it is because it won't matter to you, and I've said too many names. Um, to say that the interrupted journey has racial overtones is a bit like saying that Moby Dick has nautical overtones. And if you think about what, what is happening, so this is this is Barney under hypnosis. Wait a minute, I gotta get to the right page here. Barney under hypnosis. Ah, okay, here we go. This is Barney talking under hypnosis. Um, so he sees this, there's this ship that comes down that they see and they can see people in the ship and he's describing the people in the ship. His, they get out of the car, there's a roadblock. His first glimpse through binoculars aimed at the saucer's windows is of a face like a redheaded Irishman. An impression he attributes to the fact that Irish are usually hostile to Negroes. Next to the Irishman staring directly at Barney is a less friendly alien who looks like a German Nazi with a black scarf around his neck, but they have eyes that are slanted, but not like a Chinese. I've never seen eyes slanted like that. They're hypnotic eyes telling me, don't be afraid. So again, you hear this tone, you hear this, this type of conversation, the, this type of language that is being used to describe this stuff. Now, turns out, looking back at from, from the past, um, that ultimately Barney under hypnosis draws this guy here, which is a representative of one of the aliens that he sees. And this is supposed to be figures of the control panel. And this is a star chart that Betty draws, which is supposed to match up with Zeta Reticuli, which I won't talk about. Um, and before, between the time they were supposedly abducted and the time that they were regressed, they've also been to lectures by this guy, Carlton Kuhn. A few of you anth majors out there should be ringing some sort of bell here. One of the last physical anthropologists into racial typology, um, talking about the races of men and all this stuff that you're hearing, all this language that we're talking about, the races of men here, red, yellow, white, Caucasian, Indian, Mongolian, et cetera. It's all echoed right here. By the way, just for fun, also, Two weeks or a week before Barney um, goes in for one of his regression, um, where he actually draws that alien picture I showed you just now. If you were watching The Outer Limits, the old sci fi show in the Bolero Shield and Children of Spider County, you had these aliens right here with these eyes that kind of wrap around to the side, sort of looking like, like Barney's alien right here, kind of looking like the gray aliens that we're going to come to know more recently. Okay. Ufology, study of UFOs in one sense is all about race. It has more to do with terrestrial racial schemes as social constructs than most UFO believers are aware. But this is gonna come forward and we're gonna loop back around to this. So at this point, and what you're getting is the, the combination of a couple weeks worth of stuff that I do in, in class. One of the things we turn to after we've done all this craziness, is we say, why does this matter? So what? So there's racism with UFOs. UFOs are fringe, they're out there. Who cares? Why does this really matter? Well, it's all part of, and I've said this before, in earlier classes, but it's all part of this mistrust of knowledge, of science, of questioning cultural and science's cultural authority. It ends up with people with a lack of power, or lack of perceived power, are very um, drawn to these things. So where do we go from here? Well, one of the things that we talk about, besides climate change and other sorts of things that are also impacted by all this, is over here, vaccines. And this is all stuff we did before we got to COVID and before we got to other vaccines like this. So if you're not familiar, 
with the whole anti-vaxxer movement, it really starts with a, a, a doctor, MD, in 1998, Andrew Wakefield, who publishes a study in The Lancet that suggests that there is a link between vaccines and autism. His sample size is 12. He does this through interviews and reports, relying on people's memories. There's no statistical analysis. There's no larger scale trials. This gets followed on after this with study after study after study over the next 10 years with samples of 10,000, 500,000, 20,000, all these things, a little bit bigger than 12. And they find nothing to show that there is anything related to, um, to autism. And in fact, in 2010, they go ahead and retract, the Lancet retracts the publication, it says this, no, we disavow this, this is not real, there's no real good, good conclusions here. I may just give you all some, I got some videos and stuff here, but, but I'm afraid that we're just, that if I'm going to get all the way back around circle to the beginning here, I got to just sort of, sort of keep going. I will say, why does this stick around if that is the case? If this has been disproven, why does it stick around? Well, part of why it sticks around is because of celebrities like Jenny McCarthy, who for quite a long time, although denying being an anti-vaxxer for, for a very long time, um, claims that her child contracted or, or developed autism after getting vaccines. And she, of course, had a big audience. And if you will remember some of the, the um, characteristics of pseudoscience, a non-expert needed to correct everything else. And who is her expertise? Well, she's a mom, which gives you a medical degree, evidently according to, to at least Jenny McCarthy. And I've got this great song that I'll show you that somebody did about measles, mumps, and rubella, which I have to talk about to the students because they don't know what they are. They don't know what these diseases are because they haven't had them because of vaccines, because they, have multi, they were mostly eradicated until, you know, measles, so, uh, makes COVID look like nothing in terms of, of transmissibility, although some of the new variants of COVID. Anyway, huge transmissibility. And look at the measles cases. We were down to practically nothing. And then we got anti-vaxxers going and look at what happened. And now they've dropped again, but that's because nobody's going anywhere and nobody's talking to anybody. So vaccines don't cause autism, misinformation, the, the mixing of all this stuff together, the, the false information, the, the, the non-experts that bring this stuff up, all the characteristics of pseudoscience are why this is potentially a problem. Um, the Penn and Teller vaccination thing that I got on here, the link here, I'll, I'll give it to you, I'll send it to you through Kim. It's hilarious and sad, uh, but we shouldn't be where we are today. In fact, if you look a little bit further forward, um, with COVID and vaccine resistance, uh, good grief, Not, uh, last July, which is hard to remember what happened last July, but Trump was still in office and he was retweeting Dr. Stella Emanuel, who said that, that masks don't work. There was a cure for COVID 19s, and doctors routinely made medicine using alien DNA. Okay, now let's get crazy. You thought I was done. I'm not. December, 1950, Senator Joe McCarthy, you might've heard of him, a little bit crazy about communists, and journalist Drew Pearson got into a fight after a charity dinner at Washington's um, Soul Grape Club. And evidently afterwards, when they, they met each other in the coat room, McCarthy need Pearson in the groin just to beat him. And the Republicans, his Republican friend said, way to go, you beat up a liberal. This is wonderful. Um, Pearson sues McCarthy. Okay, fine. But then it gets weird because the sci-fi movies, the flying saucer, saucer movies that were happening in 1951 
This one, the, the day the earth stood still, starred Drew Pearson as himself, as a journalist, saying, hey, look, the aliens have landed. The whole issue here, the idea behind the day the earth stood still, extraterrestrials descend to the earth, they have extraordinary powers, they die at the hand of soldiers, Klaatu is the, the dude's name. In fact, this is, this is what he looks like here. That's Klaatu, and that's his sort of robot with him, um, and is resurrected. And his message is, space is a paradise of pure reason. Uh, there, the, the robots that live there are unhappy about the Earth's nuclear weapons. Humans have a choice. They can live in peace or be destroyed. And McCarthy hears this and sees this movie, because this is a real movie that's out, and people are going to see this movie, and he, he calls Pearson a communist tool. And you have to remember, too, that for McCarthy, communism and homosexuality, effeminacy, are the same thing. So there's as many homosexuals, LGBTQ, that are persecuted under McCarthy and McCarthyism as communist, as if anybody was really communist. Okay, but what the, the conservatives really preferred at the time was this movie, which came out the same year, The Thing from Another World. In this movie, a monstrous alien with communist traits, lack of emotion, lack of normal sexual interest, boundless desire to destroy, um, comes to earth to destroy everything and only the plucky airmen of the u.s air force are going to be able to stop him over the protests of a vaguely effeminate scientist who looks a little bit russian this guy right here this guy over here <sighs> communism intellectualism and effeminacy in the 1950s are the same thing. It's a period of anti-science, anti-communism. UFOs become a repository of all these ideas. Anxieties, 1950s anxieties about masculinity and sexuality, all wrapped up in UFOs and weird fringe pop culture beliefs, 80s and 90s. Right-wing extremists, um, I'm skipping over a bit here. Right-wing extremists use UFOs to lure disaffected white men into a culture of conspiracy. There's a whole abduction thing that kind of continues through this, Whitley Strieber and, and a bunch of other things like that. I didn't talk about Betty and Barney and that, Be and that Betty thinks she's being tested. Um, needles are going in, they're playing around with, with, with Barney's private parts and, and all kinds of stuff like this. Um, same kind of thing happens in the UFO abduction narratives that come forward. It's all been established early on. The trope keeps going. 90s and 90s come for the aliens, stay for the racism, homophobia, and misogyny. Now, did you think we were at the bottom? Because we're not. We're almost there for now. Fox News. Tucker Carlson tonight. Tucker Carlson often has, at least periodically has, shows on UFOs. Flying saucers and aliens right alongside stolen elections, GOP talking points, praise for Trump, excuses for those involved in the Capitol riots, criticism of racial and sexual minorities, and UFO experts, again. In fact, Tucker Carlson has been on Ancient Aliens recently. Because he says the UFO segments are not a joke. And he's becoming increasingly convinced that the government is actually hiding something when it comes to UFOs. UFO conspiracy theories. 
seem pretty far out there, but they are in fact a potential vector of radicalization. QAnon, Donald Trump, space aliens, cannibal pedophiles, many of the people who were insurrectionists at the Capitol believe this. Jake, Jake and Jelly, the dude with the horns, who was there in the, in the house, posted a YouTube video, which has since been taken down before all this happened, relaying his secret history of space aliens, Egyptian pyramids, including citing History Channel regulars such as Graham Hancock directly in his video. So, why does this matter? I'll leave you with a quote here from a, a paper called, um, oh, just lost it, Pseudoscience as, um, where did it go? Jeez. Pseudoscience as media effects, sorry. In the hall of mirrors that is digital space, validated, invalidated, manipulated, and even deceptive information is constantly re relayed and reactivated. Illusion and reality simultaneously coexist, and every scrap of information is a hyperlink, which by linking to other supporting scraps of information come hyperlinks, poses to anyone the risk of being trapped within an echo chamber. And that echo chamber has deep roots that go really far back and have been used over and over again to persecute those you do not like. And I'm gonna stop there because I'm tired. I can't believe I did that in 40 minutes. <sighs> so any questions? Was that all clear? You could all repeat that back to me right now. Yeah, I couldn't. My brain hurts too much. <sighs> I have a quick question. Yes. Um, also, that was totally awesome. My jaw was on the floor. Um, but so talk going back to Betty and Barney. Yep. Appeared for two hours. Like, do we have any logical theory? Are they making it up? Like, what do we think actually happened? Uh, the Betty and Barney stuff. Um, no, we don't have any idea what actually happens. Uh, I've left out a whole, obviously a whole bunch of stuff of that particular story. It's a fascinating um, story. In fact, one of the things that we show uh, that I show in class, which I will probably do tomorrow because we're doing Betty and Barney tomorrow, is Jonathan Taswell's um, uh, Breezewood, uh, a short film that, that Taswell made about his family journeying through Breezewood from, from Ohio to, to uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, to visit relatives, and they pass the last place they can stop is in Breezewood, Pennsylvania, because it's the last place where it's okay for a black man or a black family to stop. Supposedly, fascinating film, about seven minutes long that I don't have, didn't have time to show now. The time period, everything that's going on, it's all caught up in, in race. Um, and what is exactly happening? I don't know. They're in a diner. There's a woman that that is a waitress who might be passing for white, but Barney doesn't know, et cetera. Oh, it, it's just, I think a lot of it is reconstructed memories. A lot of it is, is stuff that comes up later because there's this whole hypnotic regression. And during the whole time, Betty and Barney are talking to each other and they're watching these shows and they're reading everything they can find in the library about UFOs. A lot of these things are self-perpetuating. They kind of, you, we get these things that start at the beginning and, and a lot of these early UFO tropes get in there right at the beginning. It, the, the, the idea of the mothership starts with Orthon and Adamski, you know, and all the, and then we just see it kind of recreated later. And I didn't even go into HG Wells and War of the Worlds and a few other sci-fi things that go back further or Lovecraft, which is also in there. I don't even do all of this in, in the class, just there's, there's 
<laughs> it is a tangled web of pseudoscience. What would you just there's a, It looks like there's a question in the chat. Um, okay. Have there been, has there been serious expeditions to look for Atlantis? Yeah. Right. Well, serious. Although now I'm saying serious and I'm thinking of the star series, but you know, um, sorry, get distracted here when all these things kind of cross over. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's periodically people saying Atlantis is here, Atlantis is there. There was a, um, for a while, there was some, um, a grid-like pattern that appeared on Google Earth off the coast of the Azores. And uh, that was, and everybody said, oh, look, it's Atlantis, we found it. And then Google kind of redid their map and it disappeared because it was a data glitch. And there are things off the coast of Japan that are like pavement looking things. It, uh, if you watch the History Channel, the Learning Channel, the Discovery Channel, all of these things, uh, there will probably be each week somebody investigating Atlantis. Nobody has found Atlantis. Atlantis was an allegory. Hey, Bruce, I had a question. Um, so I, I've been listening to your lectures each week from the perspective of a, a practicing scientist. Okay. And I happen to uh, benefit, I think, from being in a field that, as far as I'm aware, does not inspire any of these sorts of uh, conspiracy theories. I'm in particle physics. Uh, do you have any advice for you know, how I could leverage this position of uh, privilege in some sense. To, so part you know. of the, the physicist stuff used to carry a lot of weight. There was a time, I mean, if you, if you look, and I haven't talked as much about the science side of things because I focus more on a bit on the fantastical stuff as we're, we've been going through this. Um, you know, if you go back to that time period, if the, of the 50s and 60s, you had a lot of public figures of, of scientists of stature that talked about things and talked about not just you know their own field but a lot of different things carl sagan is one of the the big ones that that comes to mind because he was very public very very much um kind of out there and we have lost that at this point we do not have scientists do not have that same sort of authority which is in some ways is i'm okay with because that authority can sometimes overreach the the scientist who professes to know things and feels that he doesn't know anything about okay no we don't go there um yeah i mean it is a difficult question it's something that i'm grappling with my myself right now um, i'm actually looking at my own research on on neanderthal stuff and saying well and then all this stuff that i'm talking about and saying how can i do something more than this and and i'm actually contemplating right now uh, with a with an upcoming sabbatical, um, actually doing some sort of book on Neanderthals, but not a book about Neanderthals because that would be out of print, out of date before, by the time I wrote it. Um, but a book about what can we learn about from what can we learn from Neanderthals? What can we learn from the way they are treated, from the way people view them, from the way people view science that's investigating them, the stereotypes and, and things like that. And, you know, um, I can't speak really to, to particle physics, but think broader, think of ways that, that your own, I, I think one of the things that we're, we're really bad at, and one of the reasons we are where we are in terms of all this stuff is that scientists don't communicate well with the public. They present themselves as uber knowledgeable, well, this is the way it is, and this is the way it has to be. And the public reacts negatively to that, and for good reason in some cases, which leads to all this mistrust and this distrust of science and the anti-intellectualism that I started with back with Bigfoot and all that other stuff. And we have to get off that high horse and sort of talk in plain language about, yeah, okay, look, we don't know everything, which of course leads to problems because then you don't know everything. But we don't know everything, but here's what we do know. 
And if you want to understand the world around you, and this is back to the epistemology that I started with in the, in the first lecture, if you want to know about the world around you, there's ways to reliably find out about the world. And there are ways that are not. And when we talk about vaccines, that is based on reliable knowledge, on knowledge we can test, on knowledge that we can show that this stuff works. If you think it's not working, that's not reliable knowledge. If you listen to somebody that says it causes autism when this has been disproven, no, that doesn't work. So, I mean, I, that's not a, a, a perfect answer, but that's kind of my thinking right now along these lines is how do I deal with this? How do I move beyond the classroom where I'm, where I'm definitely reaching some students who are hearing this stuff? How do I get that out further? Which is why I think I probably am gonna try to write a more popular book, which I never really thought I would do because I should, because I should go further. I should get stuff out there and say, no, listen, people, there's, there's better ways to do this. And you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater here. If you really want to take that medicine that's gonna make you feel better, you can't not do this thing over here because that's not using the same, that, that's not playing on the same field. It doesn't work that way. It's not gonna be, and it's, I don't, Pseudoscience isn't going away, not anytime soon. I've heard a few people talking about, you know, in, in a few years, you know, all this stuff, all this religion and, and craziness will be gone. No, no, crazy ideas will always be around, but there are ways we can try to work together to a better understanding. Long rambling answer, but that's what I got for you right now. Thanks. We had a couple of questions come through the chat. The first of which someone asked if you've been following the U UFO things that have slipped through into one of the, I assume this is an autocorrect, uh, COVID relief bills. Yeah, so that is part, of, and that is part of what is happening with, with people like Tucker Carlson, other people sort of saying this. Look, there's a long history of the military talking about UFOs. And some of that has been kept quiet for a very long time. If you go back, um, to the 1940s, after that stuff, after Kenneth Arnold came out and said, hey, I saw UFOs over Mount Rainier, um, a ton of people came forward, uh, particularly fighter pilots from World War II, and said, oh, yeah, we saw, we always saw crazy things. We called them Foo Fighters. Um, and if you talk to, to um, commercial pilots and everything, too, you get a lot of of stories, a lot of reports of these things. And there's a little bit of stuff that's been coming out with the government kind of saying, yeah, yeah, maybe, um, you know, we might have seen something. I don't know what to make of it. You also go back to things as far as the Drake equation. Um, Francis Drake in the 1950s does the calculations that given the number of Earths, of number of stars that are out there, the number of potential planets, the number of potential habitable planets, when you do all that math, there's a huge number of planets that are likely to have intelligent life. And that's where Carl Sagan came in and said, yeah, there probably is intelligent life out there. It's probably not anything that's going to come breed with us. In fact, what, what was he said? Um, I may get the flower along here. You've got a better chance of breeding with a chrysanthemum than you do with an alien. I think I got a flower along, but something like that. Um, because no way would the alien end up looking like us, like Star Trek kind of thing. Like, oh, wait, look, there's an alien with a different forehead. That'll be fine. We'll just have babies and it'll be, it'll be no problem. So I'm not sure if that answers the question. I, I get really confused with this stuff after a while. We had another question. Where's the line between good sci-fi, which sometimes predicts the future, and bad sci-fi, which fuels pseudoscience? You know, sci-fi, sci-fi is, is part and parcel of all this stuff. And, and one of the things that seems to be a characteristic of, of all this stuff is that it doesn't matter necessarily if it's presented as fiction in this world, that what can be presented as fiction becomes part of the conspiracy, becomes part of the, the fact. <sighs> Tractor beams, 
date back to the 1930s. I'm not going to remember the author off the top of my head, um, which get picked up by Star Trek in the 1960s, the original series of Star Trek. And then in 1975, with some of the, the first alien abduction, some of the early alien abduction cases, you get a beam of light and somebody gets pulled up in it. Does that mean that whoever wrote the, the original stuff was doing something wrong? No, it doesn't. It just, think about this, the, the logic that is used in this, these types of arguments going all the way back to Bailly or and even further is that if there's a myth out there, there's some reality to it. It reflects some sort of reality. If a sci-fi author wrote something, hmm, maybe that represents some sort of reality too. There's no real distinction in that last quote that I've still got up there where, you know, this, this illusion and reality, fiction and reality exists sort of simultaneously and people do things with it. Other places, I mean, I'm not a, not a sci-fi expert. Other places, sci-fi, people then try to go do what is imagined in sci-fi. And sometimes that's good. And sometimes it leads down weird, strange roads, most of which are racist and sexist, to be honest. All right, so if there are no other questions, I will just end by saying one or two things. Thank you for, for those of you who join me for, for these crazy rides. Um, they are nuts. And every time I teach it, I dig into something deeper. I poke the bear and I regret it. I shouldn't poke the bear. I should stop poking the bear because there's more stuff underneath that bear. Um, it does make a difference and paying attention to, to these things does make a difference. Does it mean if you're reading sci-fi or doing these things, it's really weird? Does it mean if you're watching ancient aliens occasionally, you're racist? No, it doesn't. But there are people who do who are. And I suppose, you know, the call it out when you see it. Don't let people spin these tales because what we're doing is kind of saying anything sort of goes. And you, conspiracy theories have real world effects, definite real world effects. And I tried to show you a few of them and, and sort of the stuff that, that I'm doing. And this is why, you know, even if something, you know, stuff, that, and you know, I would love to find Bigfoot. I really want to find Bigfoot. I really want somebody to show up with a Bigfoot. I just think that would be cool. I don't really want anybody to show up with ancient aliens and other stuff like that, because that's just kind of weird. Um, and I suppose for those for those Star Trek fans out there, I'll, I'll just show you, because it never shows up in the in the what I'm doing here. But this is this is the shirt I've been wearing for a lot of this. Trust data, not lore. So for TNG fans, you'll understand kind of what this is. Go for the go for the Android, the logical Android, not the emotional Android. I don't know. Anyway. All right. I will stop there. Sorry if I traumatized you. I traumatized myself with this with this class. Taught two semesters in a row. I'm gonna have to sleep a lot this summer and not teach it in the fall. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, Professor Hardy. Have a great evening. Thank you.